everyone and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Elizabeth Killinger filling in for Kim tonight. We've got a great show again and we're going to answer your gardening questions. You can get in touch with us by dialing 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln or toll free 1-800-676-5446. Our email address is byf at unl.edu if you'd prefer to send us a question and a picture and we'll answer it on a future show. Make sure to tell us where you're at in the state though. And remember you can follow Backyard Farmer during the week on our social media including Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. And now let's get this show started with some samples and we've got a lot of friends here yes. tonight, don't we? All my, my friends are in this container right now. <laughs> uh, we've got some green June beetles in here. These are some of the biggest beetles that we have here in Nebraska. They are a metallic green and gold mixture together and they are insects that feed on many different kinds of fruits. They love over ripened fruits like peaches and grapes. Right now they're munching on an apple and they have these big spoon like mouth parts that they use to sort of shovel that food into their gullet so they get some nutrition. Sin can sometimes be a pest on those kinds of plants and we can take care of that with a row cover or by going out and knocking them off, you get those fruits out of there that they're feeding on. Also can be a turf pest in Bill's world where the grub lives under the on, in the soil and it's quite large, it can tunnel through the soil and create mounds, almost like a mole does. And in that case, you'd use a curative uh, treatment of carbaryl in the fall to try and take care of those. But other than that, I think they're just really big, impressive beetles that we should all kind of appreciate. Mine are all named George, John, Paul, and Ringo. Various names yes. mixed in there. Yes. <laughs> and those are the ones that dive bomb you, right? They can't. They have a mimic uh, system where their wing beat kind of mimics a bumblebee's wing frequency, and so it sounds like wasps are coming at you. Yeah. So it can be kind of frightening, but they have no stinger and they can't do anything to you. Well, there you go. Yep. Dive bomb or no dive bomb. <laughs> okay, Bill, looks like you brought a very lovely sample tonight. Yeah, I did. And uh, this is maybe to avoid being dive bombed? Yeah, it would not work. work. No, no. All right. Right. I, I would thought yourself. maybe that would help. Yeah, nice try. All right, so <laughs> this is uh, just, this is bug spray. Uh, it's an insect repellent. Um, and this, why am I talking about this in a turf chair? Uh, it's because it's kind of a PSA for our turf grass managers uh, out there. Um, when you're out at a golf course or athletic field, it's really tempting when you're getting swarmed by mosquitoes, especially now we've got all this rain and they're starting to really become more prevalent to um, apply bug spray. But you might not realize that the bug spray can actually kill the turf. So in the professional world, we call this off spot. It's not really a disease, but it kind of looks like it. And you diagnose it by the grass is dead in a circle, except for you have two footprints right where the person was standing. So if you're on a golf course green or fairway or tee, or you're on an athletic field or just nicely maintained lawn even, uh, please go onto the gravel and, and when you're spraying these insecticides and also even some of the sprayable um, uh, sun, sunblocks too, they can also cause this damage because it can uh, you know, harm the turf. It generally isn't lethal, but you'll see this kind of halo ring of dead grass with two footprints right in the center of it. So if you see someone out there, you know, kind of help them uh, explain how to do that somewhere else. Okay, not what I thought your sample was going to be about tonight. <laughs> no, I, mean, I, I didn't know what to, I didn't know what to talk about, but it was just like I saw it in my garage and I was like, yeah, that's a good thing to talk about. So that's what I did. I learned a new disease. Off there you go. Off, off spot. Off spot. Yeah. Yeah. And Kyle, what do you have for us tonight? Uh, this is not quite as exciting as bug spray, but um, <laughs> we have some uh, peonies that we found on campus with tobacco rattle virus. And so if you can see on these leaves here, instead of your typical nice green peony leaf that we would expect, we have this kind of model um, where there's these yellowing, yellow lines that are kind of going through it in just weird different patterns. And we also have one of the seed heads here as well. And you can really see just how deformed this seed head is. Um, the seeds are much smaller. All the other peonies um, out there have seed pods that are probably two to three times this size. And so this is pretty, uh, pretty typical signs of a virus where it's attacking the entire plant. The reproductive uh, parts are being affected as well. As far as control, not a whole lot to do aside from pruning at ground level um, for this one. Unfortunately, tobacco rattle virus has a pretty broad host range. So it can affect uh, stilbes, it can affect a, a lot of your different garden plants. Or, um, so cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers, things like that. So if you are starting to see any of it, the best thing that you can do is to remove that, to remove that plant from the landscape. 
Also, be careful to remove a lot of the soil um, that's around that root ball as well. This virus is vectored by nematodes. And so if you are leaving that soil in the ground, that virus can stay um, alive in the nematodes and reinfect something else next time. Okay. And Jeff, you brought the prettiest sample, I think. Oh, oh well, night. thanks. No. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> right. Well, tonight I have a couple different things. The, the white uh, flower we have here is bottle brush buckeye. And what's unusual about this is this time of year, they're usually not in flower. And this particular plant, I have about five of them at home and the others are kind of in sunnier locations. One's growing underneath a linden and uh, this evening when I was out with the dogs walking around the yard, I realized this one is really in flower right now. <clears throat> so I suppose because of the shade and the moisture we've had, it's been able to um, keep these flowers going and, and so it's just a little later in the year. So it's kind of fun. So I'm getting a, a long bloom season out of the bottle brush buckeye. And then the light purple flower we have here is uh, Minarda. So, and again, uh, this particular one's about four feet tall uh, and it's growing on the south side of my house. So it's getting a lot of sun. And I had to brush the bumblebees away yeah. this <laughs> evening because they were just covering it. That's so. one of their favorites there. Yeah, so it's so it kind of a fun plant to have. Thanks for bringing those in and showing off all of you, all of, all of your samples tonight. Um, now we're going to go to our, our first round of picture questions. And Jonathan, you get a lot of, what is it? Um, the first one is a creepy crawly that they found okay. in the house that's kind of fuzzy, and they're wondering what exactly that little bugger is. This is the larva of a larder beetle. We can tell because it has those two horns on its tail in there, and that's an indicator that it's a, a baby version of that insect. This used to be much more common when we had larders and had dried hams and things that we'd put down there. It can feed on meats, cheeses, taxidermied specimens, but we also see it a lot in pet food. So my assumption would be that you might have some infected pet food. You need to dispose of that and then sanitize the area where you found the beetle and where you had the pet food stored. And then the next one, we have a really big bug for you. Yeah, <laughs> I like this one. This is the American carrion beetle. It's an insect that feeds on rotting flesh and decaying organisms, as well as some fungi. It lays its eggs in those things, and then they develop and feed on the rotten animal or person. In some cases, they are important in forensic investigations as well. But what's interesting about them is that mom and dad hang around and they will eat competing maggots so that their larvae have a better chance of getting to the food source. Not a pest, don't need to do anything about that one. And then our last one that we have is, what is this beastie? Got it, that's an earwig. Uh, <laughs> they don't get in your ears as the name may imply. They do have those big butt pinchers that they are sporting right there. This is a female. Hers are a little straighter than a male's which are usually a little more curved and antler-like. They use those for defense. They use those to wrestle with one another before mating. And uh, it can be a pest of some plants, and it's also a predator and scavenger. If you have a lot of them, you can actually set a tuna can at soil level, so bury it, and then either leave the tuna oil in there or put some bacon grease and vegetable oil in there, and they'll just come crawl into it, and you'll catch a bunch of them, and you won't have to worry about them anymore. Another use for bacon grease. There you go. So cook <laughs> yourself some bacon and then give some to the bugs. <laughs> okay, Bill, your picture question. Um, the viewer has a buffalo grass lawn. It's done well this year. They've received four to five inches of rain in the last two to three weeks. They haven't mowed, but they're seeing this kind of red coloration uh, type of a, a thing. They just wondered uh, kind of what's going on with the buffalo grass right now. Yeah, that's uh, totally normal. Um, it looks like um, the the, the plant can make this uh, pigment called uh, anthocyanin. Uh, it's a reddish color. Uh, when it's drought stress, what happens is uh, the sun can be kind of stressful. And so it's just some of the pigments that protect the, the foliage when it's really hot and sunny out and dry, as buffalo grass likes it dry. So it, it makes this pigment. Um, I see you have a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, it's pretty tall. You haven't mowed it. So you see a lot of the um, the male flower parts, again, buffalo grass is a uh, male, female uh, flower. So uh, don't think if you're going to you know, let it grow high and you're going to mow it, that that's going to help the, the dents in the stand up. But at the same time, it's not hurting the sand either. So it looks really good. And I, I wouldn't worry about it too much based on the pictures I saw. Oh, nothing to worry about. Just let yeah, it be a little red. Just natural. Yep. All, right. All right, Kyle, um, we have a viewer in Omaha. They have a leaf that has an infection on it, and we can see in our picture it, the tree is starting to lose its leaves, and they're wondering what's going on. Okay, that, uh, that looks like scab. Um, I guess an apple tree, maybe. Um, but yeah, that typically that's very uh, 
very common with scab is where you'll have a few of these spots um, on the leaf and then the entire leaf will turn yellow and, and can drop sometimes. Um, sometimes it'll stay attached to the, to the tree, but yeah, one of the things about scab is you'll have a few lesions and then the entire leaf turns yellow. Unfortunately, if you're seeing scab now, you're, you've kind of missed your window. Not a whole lot to do for apple scab at this time. Um, earlier, in the earlier in the year, you can, you can apply some fungicides. Um, Paraclistrobin works quite well, as do some of our copper fungicides. But right now, sanitation is going to be your best friend. Okay, just keep cleaning up. Keep cleaning up. All right, Jeff, the first picture question we have for you is a, a pine tree. It's about 38 years old, and the viewers are concerned because it's starting to lose its bark, and it's got some oozing sap. Um, they live by Lake McConaughey, and they're just kind of wondering what they think might be kind of going on with it if it's something they need to worry about. Well, you know, looking at it, uh, unfortunately, I think uh, many, many years ago, there was probably some pruning choices that should have been made with this tree that weren't made. And I think we have some, some branches that are attached in kind of weak locations that may be causing some of our problems. So, um, you know, unless they're seeing a lot of dieback, I didn't, did they talk about anything dying back at this point? Not at this point in time. Yeah. So I think if, if structurally we're not seeing anything other than using, you know, Pines will, will do that. They'll get some cankers and some other things that might happen to it over time. Um, but if, unless they're seeing a lot of dieback, I don't know if I'd worry about it right now. Okay. Um, so we're going to go to our next one. Our feature, our first feature that we're going to talk about is the importance of getting kids interested in gardening. For 13 years, St. Gerald's Catholic School in Ralston has been uh, nurturing and growing two things, a school garden and their students' appreciation for nature. It was about 13 years ago that they chopped some trees down in this space and walking by just kind of realized this would be a really great, uh, it kind of an enclosed space that would make a great learning garden and uh, through some fundraising efforts, but a lot of just donated materials and time and an openness from our administrator and that's how it got started and our, our mission from the very beginning was always to create an outdoor learning laboratory to connect kids to the natural world to get them to see how food is grown to teach science in a hands-on uh, experiential learning way kids are really disconnected from the natural world today some kids spend all their time indoors or on asphalt a lot of parents are afraid of the natural world and so you know when, 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 you, when we grew up a long time ago, there was, we were all outside all the time and kids aren't as much today. So it was a desire to get the kids outside. And here's the thing, the garden teaches itself. We just prepare the activities, but the garden teaches itself. You know, all of a sudden the bees showed up, you know, or the soldier beetles or the worms. If you give a kid some dirt and a shovel, there's tons of learning and tons of science that goes on. I love to come out here and pick raspberries because they're delicious. I also love to um, um, grab, get bugs because there's some really cool bugs in the garden and it's just fun to go and, and see all the kinds there are. It's really fun because it's it kind of like a whole other dimension of teaching because it's just like you go in and you get like math and reading which is all you're kind of cooped up in a classroom and then you go out here and you get to learn about like nature and stuff. and. It's, it's just a really fun, relaxing time while you're also learning. We mostly water, we catch bugs, we dig for worms over in the uh, like dirt. This year we came out and we um, put mulch down, which was really fun, and we she taught us that there's this cloth that you put down so there, it won't kill any bugs or animals or anything, and it will help the weeds from not growing so fast. It's really great, and I love it. I love how our school has taken so much care of this garden and how it's grown uh, the past years. One of my personal missions is to get kids uh, invested enough in nature to care about it because they're gonna eventually grow up and they're gonna be voters and they're gonna be citizens. And I think that, that never before has environmental education been such an important topic. 
These kids are inheriting a lot of the problems that we have created. And so if we can get them invested in caring about nature and knowing about nature and knowing about the scientific processes of decomposition and the nitrogen cycle and some other things and learning about insects and predators and prey, they can understand things better and they can make informed decisions. Be good citizens. Sustaining a school garden is challenging, so it's exciting to see the work that Mrs. Sullivan, all the volunteers, and her students are bringing to life, and the impact that it's having on Nebraska's youth. Now it's time for your second round of picture questions. Let's do it. And this one's not very much fun to look at, because okay. something is actually eating this uh, viewer's petunias. Oh, yeah. And it's eating them down pretty good, and yeah. they're just wondering what could potentially be going on. And that's a picture of its frass, which oh, is its, its droppings. So uh, we're talking about petunia budworm here, geranium budworm. This is a, a caterpillar that bores its way into that bud area. And then when it does that, it feeds inside. And when the plant tries to produce a flower, if it does at all, it comes out looking really raggedy like this. It is a extremely difficult insect to treat for because it bores its way in. So BT on the outside of the plant usually doesn't work. If you put it on the petals right now, on these, uh, these are petunias, right? They're petunias, yes. <laughs> it doesn't have six legs. Uh, uh, then it would help a little bit. There is some research to back that up. Uh, but most of our other insecticides are not very effective against this particular insect. So it might be time to think about moving away from those petunias and geraniums for maybe a year or two, and then hoping that the insect dissipates and then you can start planting them again. So time to diversify. Time to diversify. There we go. Okay, Bill, we have a viewer from Columbus and they see this in their lawn and they want to know what it is and how to treat it. That is the world famous crabgrass. It's something we're seeing in a lot of lawns right now because it's a warm season grass and it loves the heat. And so it is growing like crazy. So you'll probably notice it growing, outgrowing your cool season lawn that's around it. That looks like some Kentucky bluegrass there based on the leaf texture. And so you can just see this, this wide green annual grass. This is something that we put pre-emergence herbicides down for if you have a lot of this um, in your yard. I haven't really been doing that recently. Um, haven't had much, but now the seed's been kind of blowing in. It just, it gets there. And now I'm probably gonna have to use a pre-emergence herbicide next spring. So what do you do now? You can uh, treat for it um, with some different uh, herbicides. Things like Quincrack is one of the probably easiest options for homeowners to use products. Uh, uh, that contain that are gonna be fairly effective. But when it's that big, you might need a, a couple sequential applications. So it's not gonna be a one and done type of a thing. Um, and the other thing too is mow high. I have a backyard putting green. I have crabgrass at a 10th of an inch in the putting green. So, you know, if you can mow your lawn higher, you can help to, uh, to keep that weed at bay. Uh, but this time of year, you can pull it or you can try to spray multiple times. But it's gonna be tough to control this time of year. Okay, well. Better, better hope next year for a little better control. Yeah, it's, it'll be okay. <laughs> it'll be okay. Yeah. Okay, Kyle, um, we've got a viewer from By Ravenna and they saw this in their um, service berry and they were just wondering what it could potentially be. Well, I've never seen this before, but I think it's, uh, I think it's rust on a service berry. So that's going to be one of our gymnosporangio rust, very similar to cedar apple rust or cedar uh, kintz rust. Probably one of those rusts is what I'm guessing based on the, you can kind of see the horns that are growing out of the berries there. And again, um, once you're seeing once you're seeing rust on the fruit, any of those gymnosporangia rust, the not really nothing to do this time of year. Um, best control for for these rust is going to be first try to find the um, try to find their alternate host. And so there's probably junipers nearby, and most likely there are some galls on the junipers from the uh, from the rust infection this previous spring. Other thing that you can do is um, you can apply some fungicides early in the spring. So kind of right at bud break helps, um, helps control those rusts. And um, any of the fungicides, uh, some of your copper fungicides like Mancozeb would work. Otherwise, um, chlorothaninil is another product that, that would be effective against it. Okay, so a new one again for all of us. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> those, those, uh, those gymnosporangia rusts, it's, they'll go onto a fruit and then back onto a juniper and 
Just keep the cycle alive. Just bragging with the big words here. <laughs> I'd uh, you know, I, you said it twice. Yeah, you know, like you said, Quinn Clorac. Hey, I, 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 I paid for the five dollar words. I'm going to use. That's yeah, right. That's true. right. And Jeff, moving on to your next picture sample. Just use, use little word for little me. Little word. <laughs> ID. Um, we need to identify what this plant is, and you know, is it a good one? Is it a bad one? Is it indifferent? Well, I think it's kind of indifferent. It's white campion, so it's a Celine Alba, and it's an introduced plant uh, a long time ago. Uh, there, it's kind of found throughout the Eastern Hemisphere, and now it's moved into the Western Hemisphere, and I'm sure through feed or something like that. Um, you know, it's not really a problem. Uh, in some places they'll cultivate it, it'll be in some wildflower mixes and that sort of thing. So it's not unusual to see it. Uh, it's a perennial, so enjoy it. And you know, unless it becomes a problem for you, then you can use quinclorac or something else to try to kill it. Uh, I'd, I would use confront, but anyway, so. Um, so I don't think it's a problem, it's a little unusual. Sometimes it may be confused with bouncing bet or something like that. So, yeah, we got it. They're gotta, all related. They're all related, it's close enough. Yeah, so. yeah. Jonathan, yes. for our question, it comes from our Grand Island area. Okay. We've got a beetle that's taking over the yeah. world and it's eating <laughs> almost all of Grand Island now. Yeah. I guess last year it was in Omaha, it was now really it's bad. in Grand Island. So what's going on? What can we do? I'm guessing you're talking about Japanese beetle. Yeah, just a little <laughs> <laughs> It's definitely a big problem. Uh, it's growing in the state. We've got multiple counties that have been added to the map in the last year or so. So we're seeing it expand its range. If people are seeing it on their plants right now, it would be advisable to try and treat with something like a neem oil or pyola oil. Do that on a cooler day. If you do it on too hot of a day, that's gonna kill part of the plant, it can burn them. Uh, you can also try carbaryl or bifenthrin, which is a pyrethroid type insecticide that will help to control those pests. If you hire somebody, you can use chloranthranilaprol, <laughs> which is difficult to spell, but uh, it's sold under the trade name acelaprin most often. Okay, so there's hope, we can still do it. There is some hope, yes. Okay. You could also just wait them out or go out and pick them off the plant. 7 p.m. in the evening, that is the maximum time to go out and get them off the plant. I know that's when the show is on as well, but <laughs> you can get some people to go out, maybe hire a kid, penny a head for a Japanese beetle bounty is pretty good, and have them knock them into a bucket of soapy water, and that will do wonders for control. It'll keep a lot of them off your plant. All right. Right now, we're going to focus your attention on another great all-American selection out in our garden. Let's take a minute to hear from Terry Jeans about what's happening in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the backyard farmer garden, we're gonna continue looking at our 2018 All-America Selection choices. Uh, this week we're looking at the Josophia Gypsy White. It's an improved tiny little baby's breath. It's doing pretty well so far in our garden. It has semi-double white flowers, so it kind of really pops on the border that we have it on. It doesn't get very big. It is an annual here, zone 10. It will take full sun. As you can see in our garden, it's right on the edge of one of our garden beds, so it's really getting that sun beaten down on it. Doesn't seem to be bothering anything. Japanese beetles don't seem to be bothering it. So this, this new baby's breath Gypsy White is a winner. One other thing we have in our backyard farmer garden is those Japanese beetles. Make sure that you got your bucket of soapy water and just keep pulling them off all the plants. Stop by the backyard farmer garden this week and see what's happening in the garden. So far, the Japanese beetle problem at our garden hasn't been too bad, but they are there and they are hungry. And I did see some on some roses out there today. So in the hops, in the hops, in the hops too. Oh. That's terrible. Yeah, they just like pre-beer. Yeah, the pre-beer. <laughs> <laughs> So moving on to your question, Bill, because I have no segue for that. <laughs> um, we have a viewer that from Ogallala that wants to know if they can plant the runners from the buffalo grass. Um, and if they do, should they start them in soil or do something else to them first? Or what's going to be the process if they start those? Yeah, that's um, a good question. First of all, I mean, I think it's got, if you're going to plant them, you need to plant them on your 
property. You couldn't harvest buffalo grass and sell it to somebody else. That's illegal as part of when you buy a crop. You can't do something like that. Um, but if you, need, you wanted to try to, to fill areas in, um, I don't think I would try to harvest the stolons, which are those, those stems on the top. I would consider uh, taking little plugs, though, of the buffalo grass, and you can actually plug those in those thin areas and um, a little bit of nitrogen fertilizer, and they'll, they'll spread in, especially with this heat. So I would try that because you have the roots set in the soil, so it won't dry out as quickly as just doing the stolen uh, uh, would be. So, so plugging is yep. going to be a little easier. Yeah, I'd recommend plugging. Usually, like foot by you know one foot centers is what we usually go for. And there's uh, companies here in Nebraska that um, sell plugs too, so you can just buy those if you don't want to take the plugs from your lawn. There we go. Kyle, there's a Fremont viewer. Um, they have a tall sedum plant, and the leaves look like they have chew holes, but it's not chewed all the way through so it looks like it's on the top part of the leaf surface and um, they look kind of transparent they're just wondering either if it's something eating them or if it's something infecting them uh without seeing a picture it kind of could be both one of the things we have been seeing with the extreme heat especially on some of our more succulent plants there are some insects and some critters that will go and they'll just take all the moisture out of there. And so they may, so that easily could be what's going on with the heat that we've had is there is just something that tried drinking out and, and trying to get what, trying to get what they could out of it. There are some, there are some fungal pathogens that, that will, or, and some bacterial pathogens as well that will cause um, some of those kind of a shot hole appearance. But if it's not going all the way through, I kind of doubt that it's um, a pathogen. Okay. So we'll need a sample or a picture. Need a sample or a picture, yeah. Okay. So Jeff, we have a viewer that wants to know the difference between hemlock and Queen Anne's lace. And is it possible for one or the other to grow in somebody's yard? Uh, well, absolutely. It's possible for both of them to grow in your yard. Um, the difference with uh, hemlock, they're both biennials, they're both closely related. So they're going to be very similar uh, initially. Uh, the hemlock will get six to eight feet, 10 feet tall, quite large. Um, they have that similar kind of humble, flat-topped white flower. Uh, the queen Anne's lace or wild carrot will be much smaller, two to four feet. Uh, it has a strong wild carrot smell, so if you break a leaf or break the stem a little bit, you should be able to smell that. And it does seem a little bit more ornamental uh, as it matures and less wild looking. So. They both have ferny leaves, but one's quite large, one's much smaller. Mm. And they're both really, really common too, aren't they? They're both really <laughs> common. I, and I, they're both difficult to kill too, once they get established, because they set large roots. Wow. Right? Okay. I get to use big words today too. Okay. okay. So, Jeff, in Papillion, the viewer wants to know how to permanently get rid of Lily of the Valley, and is it possible? How to permanently get rid of lily of the valley. Well, I would start with digging. That's what I would start with. And hopefully you can avoid having to use a herbicide, but I would dig. Um, do we recommend adding peat moss or sand to compost in order to amend it? I wouldn't add either one, so no. You have enough organic matter in your yard to, to help things break down and use some of your stuff from the kitchen, so you have enough things you can use. A uh, viewer used a granular weed preventer in their vegetable garden and then realized that it was not labeled for use in the vegetable garden. Mm -hmm. Do they harvest or dump the veggies that are there? I would not harvest. Um, you can double check the label, but personally I wouldn't use anything once you've used a herbicide in your garden, so I wouldn't eat that plant material or eat the vegetables from that. We have a Syracuse viewer that needs to know black raspberry varieties, not blackberry varieties. So do you know any black raspberry varieties? Um, pass. Pass, okay. <laughs> when do we transplant? Oh, darn it. Go ahead, answer. No, 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 it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good effort, but. The... I think I read half the question. And you're like, we're not, we're out of here. Yeah. Nope. Okay, now we know where it is. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm the mean host. Uh, <laughs> just give me a chance to beat Chef. <laughs> okay, yep, I'm helping Kyle. So Kyle, the zucchinis, um, they looked really great and then the ends start to turn brown at the tip and get all mushy on the vegetable. Blossom end rot. Uh, dead interior <laughs> branches on the spruce, they need to know if it's gonna spread to the other ones in their windbreak and they're in pilger. Uh, if there's just 
you're kind of the inner branches are bare. That might just be normal. Um, they, they they will lose their inner their inner needles. If you are seeing some discoloration, it could be a fungal pathogen that might spread. But I would uh, just watch it. It's probably just normal. The cucumber vines just all of a sudden up and wilted, no sign of insects, anything along those lines. What could be going on? Most likely bacterial wilt. Uh, you probably just missed the insects. In Omaha, a young swamp white oak um, has a long trunk wound and it's oozing soft, squishy stuff out the top. Is this going to be a problem? Most likely, yeah. Any um, anytime you have a, a trunk canker that c is covering more than 25, 30 percent of that trunk, that's going to be an issue. If a clematis uh, has a virus, can it be cut back or do they need to rogue it out and take it out? You should rogue it out. Um, if you just cut out the infected portion, the virus will show up in some of the other parts. So rogue the, rogue the entire thing out. I should have disqualified the last question. No, that's fine. <laughs> that's, yeah, thanks thanks that's for the right. help. Yeah, you're welcome. It's the only time you're going to be Unfair Jeff. host. <laughs> okay, Bill. Yes. When can I seed and till my lawn for fall seeding in Sydney, Nebraska? Sydney, I would do it. I would till it up in uh, middle of August and seed about then. You say control wild violets in the fall. What exactly does that mean? It means wait until we're getting closer to frost because when we start to get those frosts, the sugars and all those uh, good juices get onto the roots and so the herbicide gets brought along with it and we get a much better kill. So windmill grass has moved all over the state. Is that windmill grass a perennial and how do we kind of get rid of it? It is, and um, uh, t tenacity, mesotrione is a grass uh, herbicide that we can use to kill it. Um, hard to find as a, a homeowner, so a professional uh, nearby might not be able to find that. Uh, the viewer has grass seed that's been sitting in the garage since spring. Will it be okay to use this fall to overseed? Um, probably, but it's hard to say. When it's warm out, there's, the seeds are still alive. They're burning sugar, and so I would put it in your basement if you're going to try to do that to keep it cooler as possible. Can I get away with a single fall fertilizer application if I mulch my grass clippings? Yeah, do it in September. Okay. Tied you. Bug time. Bug still time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No pressure. Okay. Okay. I don't feel it. No. In, Link <laughs> in Lincoln, the hostas are being shredded by these gray bugs. Probably blister beetles. And cone flowers are breaking off at the base. They're not chewed off or rotten off. Do we have any ideas? Mm, could be uh, cutworms. Cutworms often cut plants like that, but I'd have to see a picture to know better what was going on there. Okay. Um, can I use neem oil? Uh, still for the Japanese beetles or is it too late? It is not too late. You can use it on the leaves to protect them. Don't do it on a day like today, which was over 90 degrees or you will burn the plant. Spots on a red oak and dead leaves. Uh, what do you think is going on? Uh, it could be a lot of different things. I really need to see some pictures for that one. Uh, dead leaves could be a, 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 what are they, the skeletonizer that do that. So that could be one possibility. In Syracuse, uh, Nebraska, they found a very large green insect that was over three inches long, and they say it's not a praying mantis. So what could it have been? A Katie did, possibly. When do tomato hornworms appear, and what do you need to do about them? They should be active right now, and if you see them, just pluck them off the plant and dispose of them in some fashion. Okay. Yeah. Well there we go. Everybody did a wonderful job. I guess I'm out to get Jeff today. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, Jeff, you have some very lovely plants. Yeah, well, they're all right. <laughs> the plants they had earlier were a lot nicer, but this is all we got, so this is what I'll talk about. So, sorry, I apologize to all of Nebraska about this. So, the first one is a shrub, it's button bush. And it's fragrant, so I can smell it down here, despite sitting with all these people. Um, so the native plant can get quite large, 6 to 12 feet tall, but there's a nice smaller plant that's now available in the trade, Sugar Shack, that's 3 to 4 feet tall. We've used that on campus, and it does pretty well. Then our perennial is uh, hyssop, sunset hyssop, and it gets 1 and a half to 2 feet tall. Uh, as you can see, how many birds would like this, so pollinators would like this? Like, like this perennial, it's very fragrant, likes dry, hot, hot places, so. All right, plan of the week. All right, <laughs> It's okay. That's all Harsh we got, word. okay. <laughs> Did you bring those one? No, I didn't I brought them. Them. <laughs> I brought those in, so oh, that's why. Oh, <laughs> Poor Elizabeth. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, um, Jonathan, we have a um, Harbine viewer who has some sunflowers that aren't so sunny anymore. They look oh. kind of sad. They're wondering what's going on. Kind of see-through, I guess, at this point. Yeah. These are the caterpillars of the Gorgon checker spot butterfly. It's a really beautiful butterfly He's as an adult. No, I'm not making it up. <laughs> uh, it sounds made up, but it is not made up. It is a beautiful looking orange and brown butterfly when it grows up. In terms of what it eats as a caterpillar, they love sunflowers. They'll also feed on ragweed. So if you've got any ragweed handy, you could transfer them over there, get them off of your sunflower. And I would not recommend treating these since they do turn into a really nice butterfly slash pollinator. Maybe next year just plant some extra sunflowers for the checker spots and then have some that you can enjoy and some that they can enjoy. Okay, so mm. just roll with the punches. Yeah, we can all live together. That's solid advice. <laughs> <laughs> really inspiration. <laughs> Uh, Bill, we have a Orleans, Nebraska viewer, and they have some questions about their, their lawn. Um, it seems to only be affecting the sunny parts of their yard. It's getting plenty of moisture. They say that the dead spots kind of peel up easy like in scrubs, but they're not seeing any grubs underneath. Uh, they've been applying an insecticide, and they're just wondering what it could potentially be, so that way if they need to try to prevent it, um, they do the right thing. Yeah, this is one that... It's kind of difficult to see from the picture. It, like, I think I've used the analogy before going to the doctor with a cough and yeah, you're sick, but knowing exactly what it would be is kind of difficult. Um, it is bluegrass. It could be some kind of a root pathogen. Summer patch is something we see a lot. When the soils are warm and wet, it definitely could be the summer patch uh, pathogen. Um, it, but also, it, you know, it, it, it kind of looks also like some of the foliar things. So I tend to sample in to uh, Kyle to, to figure out what, yeah. what that is because it's just too many possible things. And we don't recommend anything until we really know what, uh, what we do have um, good IPM practices. Okay. Kyle, we have a Gearing viewer that has a pear tree. They're noticing these numerous leaves that are showing up. Um, they're just kind of drying up and not looking very healthy. They're not seeing that shepherd's hook appearance. Some fruit seems okay, others seem to be shriveled up. They're just wondering what could potentially be going on in this picture. Oh, that uh, looks quite a bit like fire blight. Probably, I know they were looking for the shepherd's crook, which we typically say is one of the diagnostic features of it, but we don't always see that shepherd's crook, especially if you have a moderately resistant um, variety growing. One of the things is they do have those black, um, the black petioles, and that's that's a pretty sure sign of fire blight. So um, do some pruning uh, as best you can, and hopefully next year it'll be a little bit better. And our second viewer has is also from the Panhandle, and their pear also is having some issues. It was doing well earlier this year, and then now some of the leaves are starting to die. They're just wondering if they could treat for it or if there's anything that they, they can do for this one. Yeah, this is kind of an odd looking pear spot. It's not, not, uh, yeah, not exactly what we're, what we're used to seeing. It could be, uh, it could be scab, um, kind of early scab. The other thing that I'm seeing, especially on this picture with the tattering that's, that's right next to the lesion is that's pretty characteristic of sun scorch. And so if it's on a, a fairly large area of the tree or on one side of the tree, then maybe it's, it's, it's just environmental. Okay. So just take a look and just take a look and yeah, otherwise we'd, we would need to see a sample to, to tell you more. Okay, Jeff, um, this is a viewer that has a maple tree and they have quite a few questions on it. Uh, if you take a look that you'll notice that the one side of the trunk has, has a little bit of an issue to it. Right. Um, and so they're just wondering, do they need to be concerned about that big wound on the side um, or the exposed roots? Um, the trunk has split open and they're noticing lots of large ants. So now they're wondering, do they reseal it over with a tar or paint or do they need to be worried about the ants? I think they need to remove the tree. So unfortunately, the, we have some root issues. We have a serious trunk wound there that we have insect activity in. Uh, my guess is that whole side of the tree doesn't have much in the way of, uh, of a root system and that's probably why we're seeing all that death there. Uh, there's a large unusual bug, another gorgon <laughs> <laughs> crawling, on that, crawling on that tree. So I think, you know, especially if you have kids and dogs and people around the yard, let's get the tree out, get something in there that will be nice and healthy for you. You know, it might not be what they want to hear, but it's yeah. kind of what they need to hear yeah. for that one. Yeah. A few years ago, we started a research project that was looking at growing hops here in the state of Nebraska. So here to tell us what the future holds for hops in Nebraska is the project coordinator, Katie Kreiser.
So right now we're halfway through our third growing season out here and the goal in establishing this plot was really to see what cultivars perform well here and which ones don't perform as well and to see if this is a viable specialty crop for growers in the state. Uh, so what we found are there are definitely some varieties that grow really well here in the state. Uh, things like Chinook has especially done really well. Uh, some of the varieties that haven't done as well, Wilmot is uh, one, Pearl has not done as well. Um, but So we've watched them reach the top wire, we've watched them um, produce cones, and we've collected data on not only yields but also what are, what's the lupulin inside telling us? What are those acid contents? Which is the, the key component that the brewers really care about. For majority of the varieties, we are meeting those acid requirements, um, getting into that range, which is very important. In 2017, um, based on just speaking with brewers myself, um, brewers were using anywhere between one to 10% of locally produced hops of all the hops that they were using in their beer. So as quality has increased, um, as education has improved, um, their best management practices, that kind of thing for growers, um, their quality and the volume has also increased, allowing uh, more opportunity for brewers to um, in include the, the local hops in their brews. Um, so the demand is increasing. Um, it, the growers have to reach out directly to the brewers and establish those relationships, which is one of the more challenging parts of producing hops. We don't see this uh, project um, finishing up right away. Um, we see it continuing. Um, we've seen increase in acreage across the state, um, and we're still seeing quite a bit of interest. Um, we uh, just had our introduction to hop production workshop, and we had about 45 people in attendance for that event. So there's still um, a lot of interest, and there's still a lot of need for local hops. Um, I mean, brewers, they do want to start incorporating that. And so we've, we've got a long way to go with this industry. It looks like the future is bright for hops here in the state. And just so you can mark your calendars, Backyard Farmer will be taping the final show of the season, September 12th at Midwest Hops in Plattsmouth. So mark your calendars, be ready to go, check out the hops yard and do all that fun stuff. Sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. I think so. It's a great place. Yeah. I think it's fun to go. They a bunch of local beer there too and everything. They do. Yeah. It's, I'll be there. Time for our last round of picture questions. Let's do it. So every year this viewer by Elkhorn, their grow low sumac is covered with these galls. It's cool. really affecting the appearance of these. And they want to know, is there anything that they can do to reduce their numbers? Not really. These are areophyid mite galls. So there's a little tiny banana shaped mite that lives inside of those galls. If you were to cut them open and put it under a microscope, you could possibly see them under there. But usually this is just an aesthetic issue. It's not going to kill the plant. You could maybe try a, a, a horticultural oil early in the season when the mites are starting to emerge to start new galls on new growth. And that could smother some of them out. Uh, that would be the only suggestion I would really offer there. And then your second question is a 50 year old maple tree leaf has what looks like beads on it. Yeah, I, I always think they look like nerds, the candy nerds on there. Yeah. These are maple bladder galls made by areophyid mites as well. So again, there's these banana shaped tiny mites in there that make the plant grow this around them so that they have free room and board essentially. It's a plant tumor that they induce with their saliva and it gets them a nice new house and a nice place to eat. So it doesn't normally cause any issues for the plant. There's not very many galls that we worry too much about and these ones would fall into that category. So just an aesthetic issue. You can prune them out or just appreciate them. I like appreciate them. I like appreciate Less them. work. <laughs> this one is hot. Okay, Bill, we got an ID and they want to know what kind of weed this is. Um, they're in Washington County, Nebraska. It's another world famous weed. This is uh, Ground Ivy Creeping Charlie. This is a member of the mint family. It's a perennial and it is it loves shady, thin lawn areas. And so um, that's what it is. And I'm sure the next question is going to be, what would you want to do about it? Uh, the first thing you can do is just, if you can prune any of the trees to so get more light in there so the grass can be more competitive, that would be um, really helpful. Because if we're just spraying it out, you know, it's just gonna keep coming back. It's just a Band-Aid on, uh, you know, a more serious or issue for the lawn. So 
Um, you know, if you can do some pruning or some way to get a little bit more sunlight there for that grass to grow more vigorously, mow higher, things like that, that can help. If it's still shady though, you're probably gonna have a hard time eradicating it 100%. You can use um, different herbicides out there, um, but particular ones that are good on woodies, like things that control triclopure or uh, fluoxapure, those are, uh, are products that actually can help uh, to control this, and again, that's going to be wanting to happen uh, later in the fall, and maybe sequential applications to really make sure that you you get a lot better control. But uh, it really comes down to an environmental problem first, and that's just an indicator of a little bit too much shade, um, not competitive grass. And is that going to be one of the ones they control in the fall? Yep, the perennials. You want to control the perennials in the fall. So uh, just yeah, put that on your calendar so that you don't think about it because you're going to see it in the spring. You want to kill in the spring, but the best time is really in the fall. So Kyle, we have a viewer from North Platte. They have several tomato plants and only one Roma plant seems to be looking like this. Um, it still kind of looks healthy, but they want to know what's going on with it and is it something that they need to treat? Okay, um, yeah. lesions aren't the most to find on the picture, but I kind of think uh, we might be dealing with early blight. A lot of our Roma tomatoes tend to be more, air a lot of our Roma, Roma Tomatoes are heirlooms. Heirloom tomatoes tend to be much more susceptible to a lot of these, a lot of these uh, pathogens as well. So, best thing to do is going to be to um, you can spray if you would like. There are um, any you know copper. A lot of our copper fungicides work well. Um, Dacanil is another one that works quite well for this. So that's an option. The other thing that you can do is just go out and try to remove those leaves as soon as you're seeing the spot show up, and also remove the leaves that have fallen and get rid of those. That'll just decrease the inoculum, um, decrease the amount of fungus that's able to sporulate and infect um, other tomatoes. All right, so there's still hope. Still hope. That's the main thing. <laughs> talking about still hope. Jeff, this viewer has uh, six Douglas firs. Um, the first few are showing some pictures. They're having a hard time figuring out what's going on. The, the, the tops are turning brown. Uh, one tree, it's losing its needles and it's also turning brown. They're just wondering if we could have an idea of what's going on with these spruce, if we had any idea. You know, what I think it is, is a stem canker on Doug fir, which is not uncommon in areas where it may be um, being hit with some drought, some high heat, uh, some of those conditions. Uh, and that canker, as it enlarges, right, it just kind of girdles off that, that yep. leader, yep. and then you lose that trunk. So. I know they have other, other plants, other trees in with there that may be able to tolerate a little bit drier conditions, but we have Doug Fir on campus and they, they do great, but um, they do require a little bit more irrigation, a little bit more uh, care than some of the other evergreens like a blue spruce or, or white pine. So anyway, I think that's what they've got going on there. Yeah, and it makes sense because they have other evergreens that are doing just fine in that location. Mm -hmm. so. So coming up next, we have announcements, and we're going to start off with the Greater Omaha Iris Society Iris Rhizome Sale on Friday, July 27th from 2 to 4 at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Omaha. You can go to Facebook for more information on that one. And Grow a Row Produce Donations are Tuesday from 5 to 7 at the Backyard Farmer Garden on East Campus. So if you have extra produce that you would like to donate to that cause, um, that's going to be the time that you want to bring it in. And so our next, we're going to move on to our picture questions. And because we kind of skipped some from Kyle and Jeff earlier, we're going to go back to you guys with those picture awesome. questions. So double duty. So Kyle, we'll just rest over yeah, you guys just, <laughs> <laughs> just recline. <laughs> so Kyle, the, this viewer has a spring snow crab apple tree in their front yard and it faces south. Um, they planted about 25 years ago. The last two years, these limbs have budded out. They started to leaf, but then they started to die off. And now these limbs are, are, barren and they're not producing and they're not anything living on them. Um, they just wondered what was going on. They tried to spray it with the fungicide, but it, the whole entire tree isn't affected. So they need to know what's going on. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of think that this is another uh, another fire blight issue. Actually, it was when I'm zooming in on the picture. It did look like there was a little bit of a shepherd's crook on there. Um, regardless, if, even if it's not, I think the best control will be just to prune out those branches. Um, you can see some discoloration as we go down those branches too, indicating some sort of canker. So get rid of those branches and hopefully, hopefully the tree will, will recover after that. Okay, so 
probably going to replace it eventually. Eventually, yeah. It's, yep. So another replacement one. Another replacement know. one. Um, so Jeff, this viewer is from Kimball, and they have a locust tree in their backyard. Um, it's about 36 inches in diameter. The bark on the trunk is starting to fall off. The top is starting to thin out. Um, they're just trying to figure out what's going on. Is the tree going to potentially die or, or is it going to make a comeback? You know, looking at that, I, I would say that um, clearly the tree is declining rapidly. So it's a large honey locust. So at one point it was doing quite well. Uh, I would suspect something has occurred within the root zone and I know they don't talk about construction or any particular damage and looking at it, I don't see anything there, but I would suspect something has happened in there to cause some issues with the roots, which is kind of radiating up the rest of the tree. So at this stage, it looks like it's far enough away from any targets that if you want to give it another year, wait till spring and see how it leaves out and see if it recovers from that, that wouldn't be a terrible thing to, to do, but I suspect you're gonna end up removing the tree. And better to know now than yeah, plan right. ahead and get ready to plant a new one. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. <laughs> All right, Jonathan, you, you said you wanted to answer this arborvitae question mm -hmm. from Omaha. Um, the, it's turning brown at the top and um, it didn't appear that it had any winter injury and they've noticed that the tree has slight movement and Ooh. sound associated <laughs> with it um, and they think they might have bagworms. They're wondering what can they do right now? Are they going to lose the tree or what do they need to? It definitely sounds like bagworms based on your description there. You can still get out with some BT right now and try to treat the tree. And once they ingest that BT product, it should kill them. But we're moving into the time of year where they're a little too big to maybe have that work. So just keep an eye on it and make sure that they do die. And if they don't, you may have to step it up to carbaryl or bifenthrin to take care of those bagworms. I think ours were about like a half an inch in length. So yeah. ours are behind yours. Yeah, in Omaha, they're up to almost an inch long. I had some on my desk the other day in a tomato sausage jar that somebody left me. <laughs> and they're, they're pretty big, which makes sense. Omaha would be warmer than the rest of the state. So they're probably growing a little bit bigger there. Yeah. Um, Bill, we have an Alma viewer that has a bluegrass lawn. Okay. They think they have summer patch in previous years and they've sprayed it twice already with a combination fungicide at the recommended times. Mm -hmm. It seems like over a two week time span, the patches are starting to dry out and turn brown, even though they have enough moisture. You know, could it be summer patch again or is there something else going on? We're definitely in summer patch type conditions. It's been warm. Summer patch uh, is a disease that um, inoculates, uh, is it it starts to infect the roots actually in the spring. And the, this, this uh, email said that they had made the applications this spring. Um, and so they're still seeing the problem. Could it be summer patch? Yes. Uh, some cultivars of bluegrass are a lot more susceptible than others, and so you unfortunately may just have a, uh, a weak um, cultivar to protect itself from that particular pest, and the applications may have made it help. It may have been a lot worse, especially with the cool and the, the, the wet spring that we had a nice long incubation period, and then it got really hot and really wet, and I think the summer patch makes a lot of sense in that type of environment. Unfortunately, you don't try to nurse it along. This is a wilt thing. It's a root dysfunction. Um, but there's not really a lot that we can really do, unfortunately, um, probably because of the cultivar is just kind of weak against that particular pathogen. And we've had, we've had a lot of summer patch in the clinic recently, uh -huh. and it's yeah, it's very active right and anything now. Anything that you say uh, curatively for it, I mean, not not, not a whole lot. Yeah. Best kind of just kind of prepare for next next season. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of root diseases across all of the uh, the different turf areas, mm -hmm. from take all to summer patch. I um, mean, we're seeing a lot of different it's, things it's out here. It's been a rough year for them. Yeah, grass. wet spring. So. so maybe aerate and overseed. Yeah, in August. What do you can do to try to get some to yeah. try to break that up? Yeah, um, yeah modern you cultivar try to do. in there. And mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And you can talk to your seed distributor, and they'll probably have some uh, right. helpful information about what's better uh, resistant to the summer patch. You got about four weeks to get ready to do, do yep. that work. Yeah. Yep. 